Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Claire Helikoski and I'll be facilitating this webinar. Well, let's go ahead and get started, but before we do, I want to go over just a few housekeeping notes. So first, I want to note that this session is being recorded, so if you need to leave during or if the timing doesn't work for you or if your internet drops out, then you can view the recording. It will be available within 24 hours in our webinar recording archive, which I'll have a link to at the end of the presentation and is also available in our slides. Throughout the webinar, the polls, files, and links will be interactive, and Michael's prepared a couple chats for you as well. During the webinar, if you have questions, you can use the question and answers box, and I will be in there to respond as best as I am able. If you think of questions later or you're watching this as a recording, then you can go ahead and send questions to writing support at waldenu.edu or visit us during our live chat hours to have an immediate response. During the webinar, if you're having any kind of technical issues, then you can let me know in the Q&A box and I do have a couple tips and tricks that may help resolve your issues, but you can also find the Adobe Help button at the top right of the Adobe Connect panel. So at the top right there, and that is Adobe's official support. So if you're having major technical issues, then I would suggest going there. But do let me know first so that I can uh, give you any tricks and tips that I have. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And I'll hand it over to our presenter today, presenter. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar regarding uh, lit reviews and annotated bibliographies. My name is Michael Dusick, and I'm, I'm really happy to be leading this webinar today. Excited. Um, essentially, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at these two genres, or these two written genres, both the literature review and the annotated bibliography. We're going to discuss some uh, conventions or some typical uh, characteristics that you might see uh, or encounter in literature reviews and annotated bibliographies. And we're just going to kind of go through some general formatting and organizational tips as to how to uh, organize these documents and get them to a place where they're useful to both you and to your reader. So that was kind of my broad strokes overview. Uh, here are the more specific objectives of this particular webinar. Um, we're going to, again, overview these, these things. We're going to talk about some conventions of these two genres. Uh, you know, the purpose of them, what are they really meant to accomplish, right? I think the literature review and the annotated bibliography are, are somewhat related, but they really are meant to accomplish different things. They have different purposes. We're going to look at the formatting and organization of these documents, which are pretty significantly different, right? Um, so we're going to see kind of how they're different and, and how one could perhaps inform the other. We're going to look at some writing tips and some examples of this, uh, some things that can save you some time and perhaps some, uh, some anxiety, uh, some headache. Uh, and some, some examples to, to show you kind of how these are typically formatted and what they, they look like typically in, in the academic community. And lastly, as I mentioned, we're going we're gonna to discuss the relationship between these two genres, kind of how one can lead into the other and how um, really these are, are in some ways working with the same materials, even though they're doing pretty significantly different things. But yeah, to, to break this down a little bit, to, to talk about these alternative names, you can see this as an annotated bib, right? It's just kind of a shortened version of bibliography there. Um, for an annotation, you know, a part of an annotated bibliography, think of an annotation as really anything, anytime that you're interacting with a source, right? Uh, and a broad definition, an annotation is any, any mark that you make in a, in a document. So if you are highlighting something, if you are underlining a piece that you're working with, um, maybe writing some notes in the margin or, or putting a, a question mark next to something that you need to look up, these are all considered annotations. For the purpose of, of uh, annotated bibliography, it's, it's sufficient to think of this as working with a draft or working with a, a, a source, excuse me, working with a, a piece of scholarship that you might potentially use in your research. Lit review, that's another... Uh, I guess a shortened version of the word literature review, right? So these are really used interchangeably. Um, so if you see these kind of uh, shortened versions, you can assume that, that uh, they're referring to these, these two documents or one of the two. So to begin with then, let's, let's 
pick one and <laughs> for the purpose of this webinar. We've picked the annotated bibliography to start with. But um, before we get too into kind of breaking this up, I want to talk about how you know the annotated bibliography is primarily a research tool. Okay, it is it is meant to aid you in in collecting uh, your research and and kind of sussing out both the what this this source is doing, you know, how it could do this thing better, and then you know how this might be useful or applicable to you in your research. But but to ground this, I want to I want to start with the foundation that an annotated bibliography is a research tool. It's meant to help you organize your research, right? Okay. Now that we've established that uh, kind of foundation, foundational definition here, uh, let's let's break up these two words: annotate to make or furnish critical uh, or explanatory notes or comment. Yeah, it's just it's to work with a draft, right? As you guys are are you know scholars now uh, in in kind of a higher level, a, a post post secondary uh, level here, generally speaking, uh, you really can think of yourself as professional readers. When you read a scholarly source or read a source that you're thinking about using in your research, you don't want to be a passive party to that. You want to actively engage with that source. Uh, and, and annotations are part of doing this, making notes in a source, underlining things, highlighting things that you may need to look up again. These are all considered annotations. But again, for the purpose of this discussion, an annotation is really is really working with a source, is is you know, this kind of critical or explanatory note that you provide uh, for that source. A bibliography is, is defined by Miriam Webster as uh, the history, identification, or description of writings or publications. Yeah, you know, really what we're looking for here is, is kind of publication information, history, identification, description. Uh, where is this source coming from, right? Where are you getting this from? Um, and, and how does this, you know, compile into a list of other sources on a related topic. I know that's a little bit wishy-washy on the second part of this definition, but this is going to become a little more clear as we take a look at, you know, how to compile this, what elements go into an annotation or an annotated bibliography uh, kind of entry. Um, and, and yeah, that'll be a little bit more clear as, as we go on here. For those of you looking for a resource outside of this webinar discussing annotated bibliographies, in the bottom right corner of this slide, you can see we have a link there to our annotated bibliographies page. And what this is is that, you know it's it's a it's a website, it's a web page that uh, it explains how annotated bibliographies work, right? Um, the elements that need to be included in a typical annotated bibliography, and it gives you an example there of what an annotated bibliography could could look like as well as should look like. Better said. So you know if you're if you're watching this recording or if you've downloaded the slides and want to refer to a resource about this topic after the fact after this webinar, this uh, is a great one. I would recommend using it right there in the bottom right. Thinking about the purpose of annotated bibliographies, um, yeah, you can think of it as it has certain purposes for the reader and it has certain purposes for yourself. As I mentioned, this is is primarily used as a research topic, but a research tool. Excuse me. But it's not uncommon to, to, be, uh, to get an assignment to complete an annotated bibliography within a course. So there is something of a, a reader awareness or a, a purpose for the reader as well as for you, the researcher, compiling this. So for the reader, what, this, uh, what an annotated bibliography can do is, is it can inform the reader about a particular topic. It can demonstrate uh, kind of a source's value or why a source is important within a topic area, right? And it can show depth or breadth of research. Uh, an annotated bibliography is generally going to consist of, of a, a many entries, right? Throughout your research process, you're going to continue to add to this probably. Um, but, but it's going to show, again, a breadth of research. What information is out there on a topic? For yourself, again, this is a research tool. This is helpful in note-taking and reflecting on your source, right? A lot of, I think, the, the difficulty of writing is knowing where to look, right? And being able to save yourself time in referring to a source that you've already read can be really valuable in that you don't have to reread that source, right? You can look at an annotated bibliography and say, okay, that's what that source is about, and here's why I thought that that was something useful to me in my research process. So really, it's to save you time, right? Promotes analysis and critical thinking. Yeah, what an annotated bibliography pushes you to do is not just summarize a source, 
but actually, you know, kind of critique it, right? And take that critical eye to it. One of the, the paragraphs in annotated bibliography focuses specifically on critiquing that source. What is that source doing well? What is that source, perhaps, what could that source do better, perhaps? Um, and, and in this way, you're kind of joining that conversation as a scholar. So this it does this as well. Lastly, it prepares you for a writing project. It's a way of compiling your research so that you can kind of have it all in one place before you, uh, you know, get off and, and get towards creating an outline or even uh, drafting. It's a place to store the research that you've already done. So in that way, it, it can be really valuable. Where will you encounter annotated bibliographies? Yeah, as I mentioned, you might see these in course assignments. It's, uh, you know, when, when I would teach writing, this would not be an uncommon assignment for me to, to give my students. And I know a lot of professors at Walden especially will, will assign an, an annotated bibliography uh, to, as a beginning or as a jumping off point to a larger research project. Um, and I think, you know, they do this because they, they, they think that this is an important element in the research process, right? So, yeah, you might encounter these as course assignments. Beyond that, uh, you know, for those of you working on a larger project, like a, like a capstone or a dissertation document, um, these are really meant uh, as a kind of a pre-writing strategy or, uh, again, a tool uh, to allow you to approach that larger piece uh, more efficiently uh, and, and being from a place of being more informed, right? You're going to have researched more and you're going to be a, a more informed individual about that topic. But again, it's not uncommon to see these in course assignments either. So there's kind of the, the do it for the professor side and there's the do it for yourself side. And as you get to, to you know, again, these capstone or dissertation documents, the do it for yourself to save yourself, the, the anxiety is going to, I think, kind of become the dominant purpose here. But alas, you might see these in course assignments too. Okay, talking about formatting and, organiz and organizing <laughs> an annotated bibliography, the first thing to note is that these are like a references list. These are going to be alphabetized, right? So you're going to start with the, the you know, the, those sources that, that begin with A in their reference entry. And this is kind of a brief outline here that discusses this. So as you can see, you're going to start with a reference entry. Um, in alphabetical order, and then you're going to, below that, put your annotations. And these are a number of paragraphs that we're going to break apart in a, a, a coming slide, but for the purposes of right now, you can think of the annotated bibliography or each annotation as having two pieces, right? You're going to have your reference entries, which is APA formatted. It looks exactly like a reference entry at the end of a document or at the end of a piece that you've uh, composed, and you're going to have your annotation part. So these two parts. Now, again, as I mentioned, the annotation part is going to be broken down further, but let's let's start here for now, shall we? And this is how this is going to look in this kind of brief outline. You'll have a reference entry, and then below it, you'll have your annotation piece, and you'll just keep listing those sources in an alphabetized order there. Sure. And to break this down a little further, as I as I as promised, as I said that I would do. Um, you start again with this reference entry that is in APA formatting. And a helpful resource that, that I know I use a lot, and I, I think I know Claire uses this a lot too, is this link here on this slide for common reference list examples. And what this link has is it provides uh, some formatting for some commonly used sources, things like journal articles, like books, like web pages, even down to things like course materials or interviews or these type of things. And so it's going to have a, a number of different format in each each source has a different formatting right and here this link will give you some examples of those that you can really use again as examples to kind of double check that your reference entries are correct now the second part uh, as i mentioned can be kind of broken down into a number of parts this annotation and you for this you're going to use consistent paragraph formatting it'll be double spaced right but these this annotation part oftentimes is broken down into two to three paragraphs, right? In a three paragraph annotation, you're gonna have one paragraph that summarizes the source. What does it say? What are these authors doing? What are their conclusions, right? What does this study find? You're gonna have a, a paragraph analyzing this, this source or criticizing the source. 
what did this piece do well? What did this piece, where, where, what are some opportunities for this piece to have been better? Is there potentially uh, opportunities for furthering research that this piece has brought up, right? That would be another kind of analysis piece. And lastly, in a three paragraph annotation, you're gonna have a application paragraph, which essentially states why this piece is important broadly in, that, in your field, but more importantly, how is this piece useful to your research process or your research project, right? Uh, something that would be typical to include in an application paragraph would be uh, something like, I feel I'm going to use the data from page 12 on in my background section or something like this. My point is, is that this is how this applies to you, right? How is this useful in your specific research project? A shorter version of an annotation can only have two paragraphs where you kind of combine the summary and analysis and then have a, a separate application paragraph. In an even simpler annotation, maybe for your, yourself as you're reading a number of sources, you might just have a summary paragraph, right? Um, but my point is, is that there's a number of different ways to do this. If you're encountering this as a course assignment, it's likely that the, the professor is going to ask you to include three, a three paragraph annotation. If you're doing this on your own, right, and this is not part of a course assignment, this is just a research tool for you, uh, you can choose to format this however you want, right, because it's, it's about finding what's useful to you personally. But this is the format that, that we think is, is quite effective. And, and again, in course assignments where you're being assigned an annotated bibliography to complete, it's usually going to be either one of these two, and I would say primarily the three paragraph annotation. And again, yeah, it depends on your purpose and the faculty expectations. I, I would like you know, to remind you guys at this point that it is certainly appropriate to reach out to your faculty um, to, to ask them those questions, uh, to clarify, you know, are you expecting a three paragraph annotation or is a two paragraph annotation appropriate for this piece? Um, I guess I, what, the reason I say this is oftentimes I find students are a little bit reticent about contacting professors with questions. But I just want to reassure you that this is a, a perfectly appropriate question to reach out to your faculty or your, to your professor with. Okay, yeah, to break this down a little further from you know, the annotation piece here, a summary, of, a summary paragraph is going to be your first paragraph of your annotation. And again, this is factual notes. Um, this is what you know, you're summarizing this piece. You want to use the past tense in APA specifically. You want to use past tense when referring to pieces that have already been published. A good way to think about this is that this has kind of already been said, right? It's in, as it was published, say, in the year 2012, it has already been said in the year 2012. So it is appropriate to discuss that piece in the past tense. In your summary paragraph, you're going to use your own words. Uh, and really, you want to focus on the purpose the methods and the findings of the study, right? What did this study set out to do? How did they plan to accomplish that goal or, or test that hypothesis? And then at the end, what did they find, right? What, what were their conclusions? What were they able to draw from this study? And, and in your summary, when thinking about what to include and what to omit, what to leave out, you really want to include the most relevant information there, right? What's the meat of this study? What did these authors really look for and what did they really find? These are things to include. Uh, you know, maybe smaller pieces about, about the methodology or some smaller details uh, that the author includes that didn't turn out to be as important to the conclusion of the study. These can be things to kind of omit. But again, it's what's relevant to your research topic. That's the information that should be included in the summary paragraph. Now, the analysis paragraph, your second paragraph of an annotation, uh, I often refer to this as the, the critique paragraph, is really about bringing this critical eye to your engagement with the source, right? You want to take questioning notes, focus on the strengths and on the weaknesses of a source, right? What could this source have done better? And we're going to look at a couple examples later on in this, uh, in this presentation of some ways to kind of critique a source and to pick apart ways that a source could have uh, maybe tested something more accurately. But we'll get to that in a minute. In an analysis paragraph, you want to kind of start broadly and work more specifically. Again, broadly, you know, this study is doing this well. More specifically, it could do this better. And, and that's just kind of a general 
way to, to kind of approach an analysis paragraph. And lastly, don't feel the need to be nice here, right? And I, I think this is an important point about scholarship at the graduate or, or PhD level in general. And that's that, you know, you're entering this conversation, right? So it's okay to disagree with the author. I mean, I, I would encourage you to keep a professional tone, but it's, it's okay to, to uh, encounter a study that where you say, you know, I don't think that this is a very accurate study for these three reasons, right? That's okay. That as a, as a scholar, as someone who studies in this field and who is familiar with, you know, scientific method and, and other uh, ways to test, test hypotheses, it's appropriate for you to add your voice to this, even if it's in disagreement. Just, just a, a, a general note for you all there. Your last paragraph, again, is, is this application paragraph. Take notes as to your reactions. That's, that's a, a good tip there. Um, but again, you want to relate the source to yourself, to your field, to other scholars, to your intellectual communities that, that you are a part of, etc. Uh, in an effort to recognize how this could be useful to you and to your research, pro uh, research project. So I, I, again, just simplify this a little bit. A good application paragraph will talk about maybe the significance of the study in the field. So and so study is, is foundational in the field of psychology because it studied X, Y, and Z that produced a lot more research. That would be an, a, a, an appropriate detail to include in, in an application paragraph. But again, where it's most important to you as a researcher would be this, how is it useful to my research project? I would like to use the methodology of this study to then test a different hypothesis in my dissertation, something like that. Uh, but you know, again, it's going to be different for every person. But the application paragraph, as you think about this, as you approach this, the, the important part is how is this source useful to me? That's how it, it applies. That's where the rubber meets the road here. So again, a typical annotation will have these three paragraphs, and each of them does something pretty significantly different. Next, we're going to have some examples of these, okay? And, and for the summary paragraph, I don't think I'm going to read this whole thing because, you know, I think, I think you know, at this level, you guys are pretty familiar with summarizing a, a piece. Um, but this is what this can look like. Thompson, Kirk, and Brown conducted a study to determine how burnout and emotional exhaustion of female police officers affect their family environment based upon role ambiguity and role overload. As, you know, this, this goes on to, to summarize the rest of this piece. As you can see, it talks about the sample size here. It talks about the methodology, this mailed survey thing. And at the end, it talks about these findings. They found a relationship between supervisor support and reduced role stressors. To, talk, to get back to our last slide, and then to refer back to that in an example here, what this does is, is it, it talks about what the authors were looking to find. It talks about how they plan to, to find that or to test that hypothesis. And then it, at the end, it talks about what they did find, the conclusions of that piece. So you can see all the parts are here. One thing that's important to note as we look at this example, as you can see, there are no uh, citations here, right? In an annotated bibliography, the reason why oftentimes we don't include citations is that this can be seen a bit as, as redundant. So, you know, like if, if you have a, a, a reference entry above your annotations, it's kind of implied that what follows here based on the genre of annotated bibliographies is a summary, a, a critique, and an application of this, of the above source. Um, however, in some course, uh, course assignments, you may be required to cite within the, the paragraphs of an annotated bibliography. So that, again, would be up to the expectations of the instructor and the purpose at which you're using this for. If you're using this, an annotated bibliography, as a research tool, you, you, know, you don't need to necessarily include citations uh, there because you know where you're drawing this from. If you're turning this in for, for a grade, you might want to include citations there because yeah, that's conventional in, in APA formatting in general. But again, if you have any question about this, this would be uh, something to reach out to your professor about. And this would be a, a, a perfectly appropriate question to ask. To wrap up this slide then, <laughs> the summary paragraph, it, it summarizes, right? You, you talk about what this study is, is doing. 
the analysis paragraph, then you are working with this piece, right? You're talking about the strengths and the weaknesses. Although Thompson et al. made a significant contribution to the field of police research, the article had several limitations. First, the researchers chose a small specialized sample that did not include police women or other minorities. Second, the researchers potentially influenced results by asking leading questions in the interviews and focus group meetings. Therefore, further research is needed with a wider demographic range to complete impartial com uh, and completely impartial interviewers. Now again, this, this has a professional tone, right? But you can see that the author in this in the, uh, example analysis paragraph is really pointing out the shortcomings of this study. The, after reading it and, and evaluating the methods that this study, this hypothetical study uses, this author kind of concluded that it could be done better in a couple of ways, right? There could be a, a wider sample size and there could be an impartial questionnaire or an impartial person asking the questions. So it, it's in this way that you can really work with the source and, and point out some ways that it could be done better, right? That's really what the critique or the analysis paragraph is really all about. What did this study do well, but really also what did, you know, what is it, is it not doing so well, right? What, what are some opportunities for this study to have been more accurate or to have been done better more broadly? Excuse me. Lastly, we are going to, you know, you would include an application paragraph. And as I mentioned, this is really where the rubber meets the road for you as a researcher. Here's what an app application paragraph could sound like. This study was valuable to understanding the relationship between employees' views of change and the coping mechanisms used. Based on the results, the business sector should reinforce positive emotions to reduce withdrawal and increase commitment to the change. This application aligns with Cotter's eight-step change model, emphasizing the positive and reinforcing employees, emphasizing the positive and reinforcing employees for their efforts. This study, as well as Cotter's model, will serve as the basis for the business change strategy of my application. Yeah. So as you can see here, this author is talking about what this study does well, or and how it kind of contributes to this larger field, right? How it, how it is applied to the field in general. In this case, comparing it to Coder's or Cotter's eight-step change model, and then at the end is where this author talks about what this is study means to their project. Right, this is going to serve as the basis for my application of a business strategy change or business change strategy. So yeah, the application is what are you going to do with it? How is this useful to you? Altogether, then, it can look something like this. Start off with this reference entry. We then have our summary paragraph, our analysis paragraph, and our application paragraph. So yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at what this can actually look like uh, on paper. What this is formatted like in in terms of an entire annotated bibliography. As you can see, we start with this title page, right? But as we go on, this starts with uh, something of an introduction paragraph, something to lead the reader in and introduce them to the topic that this annotated bibliography is going to be covering. Uh, as, a, as a note here, not all professors are going to uh, require you to have a introduction paragraph in your annotated bibliography, but I would recommend it if you're turning it in for a grade. And, and the reason being because you want to bring the reader up to speed and tell them what topic this annotated bibliography is going to be covering. I think it's really important in general to give the reader uh, enough background information to understand what you're doing in any piece. Uh, so I, if you're turning this in for a grade, I would recommend including a, an introduction paragraph. But as this is a research tool, if you are, you know, you don't necessarily need that if you're just using it for your own research. If it's not being turned in and you don't think an, uh, an intro, introductory paragraph is important, by all means, don't, don't include one. But moving on and to take a look at this, we have uh, our first uh, annotation here, uh, with starting with a reference entry. It goes on to have our three paragraphs of one being a summary, the second being an analysis or a critique, and the third being an application. And then it, it ends, right? And we have another reference entry here that starts another annotation. And this is exactly how these are typically listed. One annotation after the other, you can see that they're alphabetized. And lastly, it is typical, it is conventional to include a reference list at the end of the piece. Um, again, 
as with citing within the piece, some uh, professors, some instructors might find this to be somewhat redundant. I would have a hard time disagreeing with them, um, <laughs> but this is, is something that, that you might be required to include also. So yeah, if, if that's the case, definitely include that. One, one reason, I guess, to the contrary that I would say you should include a reference page is that you can take these reference entries from here and you can then just plug them into your document once you're drafting. You have compiled these reference entries, so you can kind of just copy and paste from there if you wish. Um, but again, this is uh, really up to the instructor's discretion, the professor's discretion as to whether or not you need to include this reference list there. Okay, yeah, so that was that was kind of the first the first bit uh, here about annotated bibliographies. Um, I, I think this would be a good time to, to stop for questions. Claire, is there any questions in the in the Q and A box that uh, you think the, the large group would benefit from me kind of exp explaining or talking through? Sure, thanks, Michael. Uh, we did have one, and it was about the kind of analysis or critique paragraph, that second paragraph in the annotated bibliography. Uh, other than biases, are there other things that students could kind of talk about in that section or uh, that are covered depending on the assignment? Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Identifying bias in a source is, is, really, is really an important point, right? And something that as scholars you really want to be on guard for always is, is when is a piece displaying some sort of bias. So that's one, that's one thing that you can talk about in that analysis or critique paragraph. Um, other than that, I mean, really anything that you see as being something of a deficiency in a study. So in our example, one thing that they commented on was sample size. And this is something I think that, that's really common to look at. You know, in a study, a, stu a study generally has a specific sample or population that they're looking at or, or you know, testing in some way. This is something that can be easily manipulated. Um, and something that isn't always generalizable to a larger population. So if a, a sample size is too small, then you know the the implication there is that you can't say that the findings are generalizable to the rest of the population. So sample size is one thing that I see commented on a lot there. Uh, as in our example, uh, again, this uh, kind of the, the way a question is asked, um, or uh, the method, <laughs> the methodology of the study would be better said here, um, is another thing that's commented on a lot in a critique or analysis paragraph. You know, how could this study have been done better would be another question to ask. And one, oftentimes the answer is, well, the methodology could have been more sound. To refer to our example once more, um, you know, if you're asking leading questions or if you're asking questions that have some sort of bias in them inherent, then you could write better questions. That would be a, another way to approach critiquing or, or uh, using your own analysis on a study. Generally speaking, though, it's really anything that you see that can be done better in a study, right? So, so I mean, I mentioned a couple here, but there are many more. There are many more ways that a study can, you know, be uh, can be done better. So, finding those and pointing those out is really what the analysis and or critique paragraph is is really all about. Any others, Claire? No, that was really great. Thank you, Michael. Cool. All right, so that's our annotated bibliography section of this webinar. <laughs> Moving on then. We're going to talk a little bit about the relationship between annotated bibliographies and literature reviews in an effort to kind of transition here to talk about literature reviews. So to kind of ping pong off this slide here, annotated bibliography is, is something that's really meant uh, to prepare you for any writing project, right? It's, it's a research tool that you can use to inform a project of any length, essentially. A literature review is going to be a foundation for the research that you're conducting, OK? So, so an annotated bibliography compiles, compiles the research that's out there that you've looked at. A literature review talks about uh, the specific studies that are applicable to your narrowed topic that you are then going to be building from in your research project. So that that's a little, a little, uh, I guess a little, that's well, a little wishy-washy. But 
Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to unpack kind of how literature review functions differently. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that this will be clear as we get towards the end of this webinar, but, and I think it will. So stick with me. The literature review then, to, to use our, our definition here, is a, a written approach to examining published information on a particular topic or field. Authors use this review of literature to create a foundation and justification for their research or to demonstrate the knowledge on the current state of the field. Yeah, that's a, that's a great definition. <laughs> um, really, what I think about literature review as is, is something that, well, it's, it's, a, it's a portion of a larger document, right, that shows the reader what research is out there already on a narrowed topic. One, one metaphor that people often use to, to, talk to, to talk about a literature review is that uh, a literature review is like a, it's like a, a dinner party, right? So each source is, is a scholar in this field, right? And they're, they're talking to each other about this specific topic, right? The literature review is, is to, to go off of this, this analogy, is, is kind of compiling what is said at that conversation, at that dinner table, right? What, what are these different sources adding on this topic, how are they agreeing, how are they disagreeing, and then you use that, as the definition uh, indicates, as a foundation for your own research. So having this conversation in front of me, I think that the next place for this conversation to go would be in this direction. That's kind of how the literature review functions. More resources here in the bottom right hand corner, we have another webinar uh, that, that discusses reviewing the literature uh, and incorporating previous research specifically. So if that's something that, that interests you, go ahead and, and take a look at that too. But again, you're developing a foundation uh, for your own research, and you're telling the reader what research has been done on a narrowed topic already. For your reader then, uh, these are overviews, uh, over, these, uh, literature review, excuse me, overviews your chosen topic and field. It again demonstrates this depth of knowledge. You know, this is what has been published on this topic thus far. And it can even show a gap in, in research that you can then focus on, right? Like what's a, a kind of an opportunity for furthering research there. For yourself, it supports and guides the research. Yeah. It can uh, promote analysis and critical reading. Yeah, definitely. There's a really strong analysis or, or synthesis part of a, of a literature. And lastly, it can help you find a gap in, in the literature that you can focus on, right? Everyone's kind of looking for this gap in the literature that they can then use their study to fill. And so this can, again, be something that, that helps you do that, the literature review is. So again, the purpose of a literature review, to break this down a little bit further, it's an examination of all the scholarship on a particular topic or field written in narrative form via synthesis. Now, there's a lot going on there, so we're going to unpack this a little further. It's an examination, so it's not a summary or a report, right? You're not just regurgitating what a source says. You're not just reporting about, you know, this source. You are examining it. So what's implied there is that you're going to be working with this source and looking at some of the, uh, the elements within the source and comparing it to other sources that way. So it's not just a summary. It's going to be all the, the resources within a certain narrowed topic area. So not all research is going to agree. You're going to have those different voices at the dinner table, right? One scholar might not agree with another. So you're going to highlight where they set, where they differ and how that disagreement has, you know, comes about, right? And what they're specifically disagreeing about. A topic, this is going to be a focused narrow or a narrowed topic. Uh, you don't want this to be too broad. You know, like if you think about, uh, say like a, a, a topic like climate change. If you go into Academic Search Premier or uh, another database uh, to, to search for different journal articles and type in climate change, you're gonna get thousands upon thousands of published articles. So you need to focus that down so you're, you're really narrowing your topic to focus on a specific conversation within that larger umbrella uh, topic area. It's a narrative, so it's not a list or, or annotations. It's uh, or organized alphabetically or chronologically. You're putting it into writing would be another way to say that, uh, that it's a narrative. You're not just listing or bulleting. You are bringing these together uh, in, in paragraph form. And lastly, it is uh, not just summary or analysis. It's synthesis, 
which is a, a, a kind of a big word that we use a lot here. Um, synthesis, really, the way that I think about it is, is bringing two distinct things together to make a new whole. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit more about this in, a, in another slide. But, but synthesis really is, is putting two things together to create something new, right? And, and this will become a little clearer in a minute. Here's our difference again. Annotated bibliography uh, organized by sources. Literature review is not organized by sources. It's organized by themes, right? So if you're crafting a literature review, logistically speaking, each one of your paragraphs in a literature review should contain more than one source. Part of synthesis is putting these sources in conversation with one another, right? So it's kind of hard to have a conversation alone, <laughs> right? So in a literature review, each paragraph should cover a theme that multiple sources approach. And that's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that a little bit further as well. But again, don't organize your literature review by source. Organize it by theme. And again, this brings in this synthesis piece, which we're going to talk about right here. Synthesis. As I mentioned, you know, like bringing two different things together to make a new whole. This is, the, the example that I like to give here is, is with chemistry, right? Synthesizing chemicals. You're taking two chemicals that are completely you know, distinct from one another. They're different. And when you combine them, you're creating something new. It's not just these two chemicals together now. It is something completely different. It's a new chemical. That is kind of what synthesis, uh, how synthesis works in writing as well. You're going to identify patterns among sources. So you know, I have five sources that all talk about uh, making a grilled cheese sandwich, right? Two of these sources have the same methodology. They say to do the, to, to make a grilled cheese sandwich in the same way. This is a theme or a pattern within these sources. It would be appropriate then to discuss these two sources together and how they are maybe subtly different in, in making a grilled cheese sandwich. Uh, it, you're, you're analyzing strengths and weaknesses of a source or field, sure. Comparing and contrasting an author's findings. Yeah, as you research in, in a topic area, not every source is going to agree with each other, right? You're going to have authors that sometimes very distinctly or drastically disagree with one another. So you again, you want to include all of the voices at that, at that dinner party. You want to bring everyone's voice in and give them a, 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 some time to express their views and relate that to the other views at the table. You're going to be interpreting what is known in your field and what is missing, sure. And here's an example of this kind of source synthesis idea. Although Benson suggested technical innovations make providing healthcare easier, Campbell et al. noted that technology is only helpful if hospital staff are adequately trained on the, on the new system. So these are the two sources. Right? We have two bits of information here. Benson says this, and at the other side of the uh, dinner table, Campbell et al. says this. We're bringing these two ideas together to make a new idea. And that's the, the bolded portion on this slide. Thus, adequately training hospital staff is essential to successfully implement new technology. Yeah, so we say, Benson says that, that new technology is, is, you know, makes giving healthcare, uh, makes it easier to provide healthcare. Campbell et al. says, if you're, it's important that all staff are trained properly on, on anything, right? To bring these together, it's important to train hospital staff on new technology. Like it's these two pieces that together yield this new point, okay? For those of you who, are, who maybe feel a little bit confused or intimidated at this point, synthesis is a, is a pretty, well it's, well, it's a high order scholarly or intellectual activity. Right? And it's something that, that, that needs to be practiced. It's a skill that needs to be developed. So if you're not seeing how sources fit together right away, that's, that's totally fine. You, you're going to be working with these sources more, and these kind of things will become more uh, clear to you as you research more and as you deal with sources more. So for those of you just starting out, don't be intimidated here. Um, you'll get it. Synthesis is something that it's a muscle that, that needs to be flexed. Right, It's something that can be practiced and improved upon. So. Don't get discouraged is all I'm saying. Yeah, this bit of synthesis adds to this conversation. Okay, we've got our first chat here. 
And essentially, I've got some uh, a, a bit of a source, an excerpt from a, a literature review here. Um, and I'm looking for you to, in the chat box, speak about the strengths or weaknesses of this example. How well, or lack thereof, maybe, are these uh, is synthesis being brought into this example? I'll give you guys a couple minutes to do this. Again, put your answers in the chat box below. All right, for, for the sake of, of time here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move along. Um, let's take a look at this. After Kroll 2016 suggested that streamlining workflow using technology would allow for more time with patients, uh, Majewski 2017 noted that technology is only able to save time when hospital hardware is kept updated. Yeah, this, this is a, 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 I, would, I would say this is an example of weak synthesis or a lack of synthesis at all. And I, I see a couple of you kind of agreed with me in the chat box there. I like how one, one student said, uh, it's a weak synthesis, and the very next student said, no synthesis at all. <laughs> yeah, it's a little less diplomatic. But you're, you're right. It, it, this, there is, really isn't any synthesis here. What this is doing is it's presenting Kroll's ideas, and it's presenting uh, Majewski's ideas, right? These are two separate things. These are two voices in the conversation. But what this is forgetting is that synthesis piece, right, is bringing these two things together. Given that, that these two ideas are both valid, say, what does that leave us with? Combining these, how do we make that new whole? Here's an example of how that could look. So again, we have Kroll's idea here. We have uh, Michewski's idea there. The, the synthesis that would make this a strong synthesis, the, the, the sentence that would make this a strong synthesis is highlighted in bold here. Thus, hospitals must invest both in software and IT departments to support the, and update technology to be effective. Yeah, so this is bringing both of these together. Kroll saying that technology could streamline this and make, uh, make for more time with patients. McJewski is saying that the hardware needs to be up to date, right? Putting these two things together, hospitals make, need to make sure that both the software and the IT departments are supported for technology to be effective, right? That's the new idea that, that we've created here. Kroll, is, Kroll isn't talking about, about you know, hardware systems within technology. Kroll is talking about how technology can affect the delivery of, of services to a patient. Combining these two, you have this, this new thing, this new elements. OK, I'm going to move on. Some kind of do's and don'ts of a literature review and the organization. Do organize this by theme, right? It says a unique organization, so we have a, a, a link there that can help you with this. But you want to talk, uh, talk about multiple authors in the same section, in the same paragraph? Absolutely. Uh, you want to allow the authors to talk to each other, to voice their specific ideas? Sure. And you want to create this kind of narrative, this, this you know, this paragraph displaying this, these authors' ideas, right? When you don't do that, when you don't organize this by theme, when you only organize it by author, there are some pretty negative kind of outcomes in terms of the effectiveness of that literature review. This limits your organization, right? This limits paragraph to one source. You can only talk about one source at a time. That's not putting them in conversation with, another, with one another. It doesn't allow for synthesis of sources. Yeah, you, you can't create a new whole if you only have one thing. Right? If you you just have the one thing, <laughs> so yeah, that that makes it ineffective also. Um, and if you organize this by author, it just creates a summary or book report feel to it. When really we need this conversational piece, we need this synthesis of these sources for this to be a true and effective literature review. Some general writing tips: use paragraphs. Uh, you are not required or, or prescribed to use headings here, 
But as you can see, this can be something that could be useful, right? To use headings. You're not required to do it, but it can be useful, right? Because a heading can, can cue a reader to an organization or changing of a topic. You know, you can also use headings to explore subtopics of certain themes. I mean, headings I don't think are a bad idea within a literature review at all. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if it helps you organize your thoughts that way, I would say, say go for it, right? This, this bit on this slide about comparative terms is really important also. The idea here being, I know this sounds kind of, kind of silly, but words matter, right? Words have meanings, right? And they're specific meanings. So you need to use a language that shows an accurate relationship between these sources. You want to demonstrate where authors agree and where authors disagree. So, so uh, to give you an example off the top of my head about how this could sound, is you might use the word similarly to show how one author agrees with another. You might use the phrase on the contrary or conversely to show where one author disagrees with another. Again, my point here being be careful about the language that you use in combining and synthesizing sources because uh, you know they, they, it does have specific meanings. And if sources disagree, saying something like similarly uh, would, would kind of be confusing to the reader. <laughs> so again, be cognizant of the terms that you're using in comparing these sources. Some means that they're, that they're agreeing, some means that they're conceding a point, some means that they're, they're flat out disagreeing or, or uh, with another source. So be, co be cognizant, be aware of the comparative terms that you are using. Some tips here for creating a literature review. In terms of the organization, note the themes and patterns as you read. And this is kind of that annotation piece, right? If you look back at your annotated bibliography and you see, okay, these three sources uh, in their source summaries have all discussed this one idea this one narrowed idea, well then, you know, that's a theme that can be noted. Use the matrix. Uh, the library offers a, a resource called the literature matrix, with, which can really be helpful uh, in organizing your ideas as you compile sources. What this is, is it's essentially an Excel spreadsheet that uh, asks you to break down sources by different attributes, things like sample size, like methodology, like a uh, theoretical framework that sources are using. There's a link here that, that'll get you to this literature matrix. I would highly recommend it. I think it's a really good resource uh, that Walden provides for its students. Um, beyond Walden, there's a program called Zotero, which uh, I've heard a lot of students at residencies say is really useful. I think it has some uh, added features uh, that, that can be really useful. So if that's something that uh, interests you, go ahead and take a look at that uh, and, and seek that out. Developing an outline. Is, is important because then you're, you know, you're taking those themes and you're saying, well, I'm going to do one paragraph about this theme. I'm going to do one paragraph about that theme. Um, so that can be useful in organizing your literature review as well. Also, you want to stay flexible as your research develops. This is just strong advice in, for research in general. Um, be open to the sources that you find uh, and don't discard a source just because you maybe disagree with it or it, it doesn't uh, agree with some of your other sources. Yeah. In terms of resources, Use general good scholarly writing guidelines, things like synthesis, effective paragraphing, paragraphs, transitions are, are uh, really useful in literature reviews. Uh, we have another resource here, literature reviews, five-step or uh, five-part blog series that can be uh, a good resource for you if you're com if you're compiling a literature review. Uh, again, as with everything with writing, it's about finding what works for you. So uh, yeah, if, if you find the Matrix or Zotero useful by all means use that okay find a resource that that works well for you is, is is my my point here here's what a a outline for a literature review could look like and, and these are some potentially some example uh headings that you could use you know we have our introduction paragraph then this author is going to talk about strategy how different sources approach uh strategy here uh historical context and continuing education yeah, you, you get it. These are the different themes that this author would have identified in the research. Then breaking it down, they're going to talk about instances where the research that they've gathered addresses these specific themes and how maybe they agree, how maybe they disagree. Right? Again, this is just an example outline that, you can, uh, that, that gives you an idea of how a literature review can be broken apart. 
in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna burn through this second chat here as we only because I want to leave a little bit of, of time at the end for questions. Um, but by all means, go back in and, and take a look at that if you if you've downloaded these slides. To recap, then annotated bibliographies you really focus on an, an individual author and a source, right? You have your reference entry and your annotation. All of those are referring to one specific source. This is a research tool that's meant to, to help you compile your research and, and see maybe how that research fits together, but it's really meant to, to see, you know, compile research and see what individual sources are doing. You know, how are they approaching this topic? What did they find? How could they have done that better? How is this useful to me? In a literature review, from that annotated bibliography, from the research that you've compiled, you need to identify themes or patterns and, and reorganize that information around those themes or patterns. Right? Under the theme of X, these three authors talk about that and they approach it in a slightly different way. So that paragraph would unpack the re, you know, these three authors' view and then some synthesis at the end about what, when combined, these things say together. What's important here? That type of thing. Here's a resource on annotated bibliographies. And here's a few resources on literature reviews, both a master's level one and a doctoral level resource there. OK, with that then, I'll, uh, I'll ask you again, Claire, are there any questions you'd like me to talk through before uh, we adjourn this webinar? Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, I did have a good one, which was, do you recommend working on an annotated bibliography and a literature review at the same time, or should one or the other potentially come first? That is a good one. That's a good question. Um, well, first and foremost, again, I would I would point uh, towards this kind of individual thing for, for different people, right? If, if it works well for you to work on them side by side, I guess I can see a, a situation in which that might be useful. For me, in my opinion, I think you should definitely do the liter or excuse me, the annotated bibliography first before you do a literature review. And here's why. Here's my here's here's why why I say that. The literature review again is really incumbent or not incumbent. It's it's really it, well, it's really important that you identify these themes and these patterns within the research that you've collected. That identifying those themes and patterns informs how your literature review is going to be organized, how it's going to be set up, and how that synthesis is brought in, right? So before you can do that, you need to identify these themes. I think that the annotated bibliography as a tool can be really useful in looking at different sources and identifying those themes. So I would say personally that you should do the annotated bibliography before the literature review. On a broader note, once again, Excuse me. It's really about finding what works for you. So if, if, if that works for you to do them at the same time and to add to individual paragraphs within your literature review uh, separately, that, then by all means go for that. That's your, that's your method. That's your process. But I would say do the annotated bibliography before the literature review. Great. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, and I think that's all the questions we have for today. So thank you for presenting. If you do have questions, uh, you can email us at writingsupport at waldenu.edu or again, visit us during our live chat hours. I know that some of the links weren't active during this presentation. Uh, Adobe Connect has been really finicky with us lately about doing some weird things with uh, links when we transfer it to the presentation mode, but all the links should be just fine in the actual slides. So if you do want to download those slides, you can go to the files pod at the bottom. It's right next to Michael's picture there, and you'll click slides, lit review, and annotated bibliography basics. So if you were looking for any of the links that weren't functional during this presentation, they will all be active and correct in that slideshow itself. I also want to have a quick plug for additional webinars. So we do have some recommendations here. You can review them in our archive or check out ones that are coming up in our webinar schedule. And we are happy to review your literature review as long as it's not for your dissertation itself. If it's for coursework assignments, your annotated bibliographies and literature reviews are great things to send into the Writing Center through our paper review appointment service. So we're here to support you that way as well. 
Thank you all for a great presentation today, everyone, and have a good rest of your day.